Well, financial expert and insider Catherine Austin Fitz will be joining us to do our first interview of 2012. It is Monday, the second day of January 2012. It's InfoWars Nightly News. Thank you for joining us. We have grave tidings, obviously, for you this evening. Our top story, the NDAA was signed by President Barack Hussein Obama in the final hours of 2011, when I guess they thought no one would notice. And we understand why they wanted to hide this. They don't want public opposition to mount to what they are doing. They want to do their dirty little crimes in the dead of night in darkness. That's when evil is done. And our report uh, has been at the top of Drudge the last few days, um, but uh, other outlets are also reporting the same thing. Obama's signing statement on NDAA, I have the power to detain Americans, but I won't. And the ACLU points out the signing statement is not binding. It means nothing. And of course, it was Barack Obama, we now know. We're going to play a clip of that come up in a few minutes. Uh, who demanded that the provision to indefinitely detain Americans be added and kept in there. Now, the question is, can you legalize tyranny? Uh, can you legalize bringing slavery back? If, uh, say, Italy, you know, 2,000 years ago in Rome, slavery was legal for anybody. Most of the slaves were white. So they could say, hey, we did it before, precedent. We're going to go to, say, France and uh, grab 10,000 people and bring them here and make them be our slaves. Could you legalize slavery? Could you legalize barbecuing children, as I've said many times, on the White House lawn? Could you legalize horrible things like animal cruelty or pedophilia? No, you cannot legalize it. There is an organic, universal right to say no to it. And... Uh, the former land of the free, home of the brave that had the most due process checks and balances now is a leading light of darkness worldwide, uh, or black sunshine, you could call it, uh, to steal a line from uh, uh, White Zombie. That's what we're dealing with here, where they go further than North Korea on paper and say, we'll arrest citizens and have them disappear into a black hole forever. We will torture citizens. We want you to be afraid. Uh, you can be stripped of your citizenship as well and flown to some black site or secret site uh, that our criminal government has set up all over the Middle East and Eastern Europe, including torture centers at Romanian uh, closed down horse clubs. Remember that came out in the Associated Press last year in 2011. This is legalizing horrors. Can you legalize torture? Can you legalize warrantless wiretapping? Every form of just hardcore oppression, the 200 proof stuff is being thrown in our face right now. And so, of course, they lied and said, oh, don't worry, it doesn't affect citizens. And then it came out, it did affect citizens. Obama said, I'll veto it. And then it turned out behind the scenes, he was pressuring people to support it. They do this because they're liars and because they don't want to admit what they're doing so that public opposition can mount. They want to have CNN and Fox News get up there and say, it's okay, it doesn't affect U.S. citizens while it does. And they want to be able to have Obama go to his constituents and say, I'm against it when he actually signed it. So it's like a hall of mirrors or something where you never know what's true or what isn't. And that's what they're looking for is this, is this fog of war where everybody is basically confused. But... This is a real wake-up call for everyone, that tyranny is here in our republic, and the corrupt ruling class who created over $1,000 trillion in fake assets or derivatives, the big mega banks that have taken over our government and, and financed both uh, political parties, now know that we're waking up, and so they're trying to at least put it on paper that, yeah, we'll spy on you without warrants. Yeah, we'll set up domestic checkpoints. Yeah, we'll federalize your local police. Yeah, we'll build FEMA camps. We'll go ahead and activate them. And we're going to start censoring the Internet. Yeah, you know, the SOPA Act really does do that. And yes, we're going to secretly arrest Americans whenever we want and disappear you into another region. That's being done on multiple fronts 
to intimidate and scare people that are awake and involved. And it's being done because the power structure is afraid. The power structure is scared and is trying to protect themselves from a public that they've robbed and abused. So here's the different reports. Obama signing statement on NDAA. I have the power to detain Americans, but I won't. There's a chilling photo, by the way, above that of Newt Gingrich. You know, you talk about Newt Gingrich being a globalist, Newt Gingrich being for carbon taxes and all the rest of it. Look at that photograph of him. That really uh, captures the essence of Newt Gingrich. But again, if you go to our article, it has his signing statement where he says that, that, that he won't implement the secret arrest and disappearance of U.S. citizens. But again, he still signed the law. He didn't bring in a line item veto, which he doesn't technically have, but which he basically had by threatening a general veto. He, I'll say it again, demanded that the legislation be put in there. Let's go ahead and go to this clip of Senator Carl Levin when he was getting blamed for all this. And he, and, and he does deserve some of the blame. I mean, you can't have these two ping-ponging it back and forth like past the hand grenade and saying, well, Obama wants it, well, Carl Levin wants it. But the point is, he didn't want to get the blame, so he came out and said, look, it's Obama that wants this. And that's since been confirmed. Here it is. And I'm wondering whether the senator is familiar with the fact that the language, the language which precluded the application of Section 1031 to American citizens was in the bill that we originally approved in the Armed Services Committee and the administration asked us to remove the language which says that U.S. citizens and lawful residents would not be subject to this section. Is the senator familiar with the fact that it was the administration that asked us to remove the very language which we had in the bill which passed the committee and that we removed it at the request of the administration that would have said the app that this determination would not apply to U.S. citizens and lawful residents. I'm just wondering, is the senator familiar with the fact that it was the administration which asked us to remove the very language, the absence of which is now objected to by the senator from Illinois? I, I'm familiar now because the senator from Michigan has shared that fact with me. Now, I know here on the nightly news, I've probably played that clip five times in the last month. We played it on the radio. It's admitted. The ACLU's done an analysis. Ron Paul has done it. Major legal law firms and, and, and think tanks have looked at it. The senators that wrote it admit it's for U.S. citizens. But for a month, we had to have debates about whether it affected citizens or not. Now, why did they do that? To kill opposition. Again, why did Obama say that he was going to veto the bill? so that people thought, well, let's not oppose it. He's just going to veto it anyways. The whole time he was the one demanding it, it be in there. That is, his handlers were. That's how these political people work. That's how their deception operates. That's how they get this stuff done. In fact, coming up in a minute, we've got uh, you know the headline where they announced, oh, they pulled the bestiality section out of the NDAA, saying the troops can basically bring barn animals you know, uh, into the uh, bases. And then Senator Cornyn, when he got criticized for passing that out of Texas, he came out and said, well, we've stripped it, but they had the House add it back in. That's going to come up. Well, here it is. Bestiality and sodomy repeal stripped from NDAA. Then if you scroll down, they've got a link to the government track uh, site, and they've got the letter from Cornyn saying he had it stripped, but he knew full well and voted later to accept it when the bill came back from the House. And so now it's the law that bestiality is legal in the military. I mean, this NDAA, things just get crazier and crazier every year now. What's going to be in next year's that you can have sex with Martians or ghosts or Keebler elves or something? I mean, eh, point is, why is everything getting so weird? Secret arrest of citizens, a worldwide declaration of war, Announcements that you can be taken, you know, overseas to be tortured. It's crazy. It's crazy. And it's the end of Posse Comitatus. Do those of us that were right about the fact that Posse Comitatus is being eroded in this nation 
so that the military can be on the streets of America? Do we get an apology now? This is all coming true? No. Hundreds of publications, CBS News, NBC News, ABC News, New York Times, every day I see articles saying Alex Jones and Ron Paul are insane. They're worried about military on the streets of America. But at the end of the day, I want to state this. They want to keep this stuff secret because they know it's outrageous and they don't want to be publicly rebuked for it. They want to just implement the law, quietly find cops and military that will follow unconstitutional orders, and they don't want us there the whole time pointing out it's illegal and wrong. Again, it's illegal to pass a law saying black people aren't humans again and are slaves. And it's illegal to say we're all slaves and have no due process or rights and can disappear into a torture camp. So again, this is all a fraud and tyrants always try to create legalese to rationalize what they're doing. But as a human being, I have a right to say no to it and to decry it. So they're not strong. They're doing this because they're weak and they're scared of the public waking up to them. And because they want to have it on paper that they can start using the military and hit men and contractors against the American people. Remember, Obama said and has been using these new powers he declared for himself to kill U.S. citizens he claims are connected to terrorists. Well, don't you want to capture them then if, if, if they have such great intel? Don't you want to give them a trial so we can actually hear the facts? No, they just say they're terrorists, so they don't deserve rights, and now they're saying the American people are terrorists. And they sign this thing on New Year's evening because they're embarrassed of it, showing that they don't want opposition to start being uh, basically ratcheted up against this. Now, I have another report here because this legislation says they can secretly arrest, torture, or kill citizens, but following an older piece of legislation in the previous defense authorization for enemy combatants, they say, we won't secretly arrest or kill or torture citizens, but the Secretary of Defense or the President can strip you extrajudicially of your citizenship, and then you disappear to a black site, a torture camp overseas. Uh, in places like Egypt and Romania, uh, these sites have been exposed. So now on top of it, they've introduced another bill, H.R. 3166, Enemy Expatriation Act. But notice it says that if your speech supports the hostilities, if, you, if, if what you're doing and saying, we've seen attorney generals say that if you criticize a war, you're aiding terrorists, that citizens don't have a right to be against a war, you could be disappeared into a black hole. Uh, so they're trying that as well. But in the final equation here, what all of these tyrants that have helped steal trillions of dollars and helped centralize the economy and bankrupt things, what you need to know is that you have a 9% approval rating Congress, 9% and dropping, the lowest it's ever been. Both parties are universally decried. And all the so-called liberals I know have been out for years buying firearms and are waking up to liberty. What the system needs to know is that the people are voting with their dollars and buying record amounts of firearms as their response to this tyranny. And they're even telling different groups that call and, and do surveys, why are you buying guns? They're telling them because we're worried about a corrupt government. We're worried about a collapse. We don't trust the government. But I'm going to get back to that article in a minute. I want to briefly just finish up with the NDAA with some more clips. Uh, you just saw Senator Levin saying the White House demanded this. That's why we added this in there. You can go to the legislative record and see that as well. We don't just take Levin's word for it. Then we have some of these other clips. We'll just play the clips and then come back and comment on them. And to those American citizens thinking about helping al-Qaeda, please know what will come your way. Death detention, prosecution. And when they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. Your time is expired. Get a lawyer. You're an enemy combatant, and we're going to talk to you about why you joined al-Qaeda. But you read the legislation, it's for the American people, and they admit it is. So it's this idea of al-Qaeda. Uh, so you should be arrested, Lindsey Graham. Uh, you've supported the Libyan attack, and they've now put real al-Qaeda in charge there. 
And I could pull up London Telegraph headlines and others. Al-Qaeda flag now flies over Tripoli. Uh, I mean, our own government created Al-Qaeda. That's on record. But you always invoke it. Give up your rights or Al-Qaeda will get you. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, go to the next clip. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, warned, the means of defense against foreign danger historically have become instruments of tyranny at home. Abraham Lincoln had similar thoughts, saying, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. My well-intentioned colleagues admonitions in defending provisions of this defense bill, yes. their legislation would arm the military with the authority to detain indefinitely, without due process or trial, people suspected of an association with terrorism. These would include American citizens apprehended on American soil. I want to repeat that. We are talking about people who are merely suspected of terrorism or suspected of committing a crime and have been judged by no court, we are talking about American citizens that could be taken from the United States and sent to a camp at Guantanamo Bay and held indefinite attention. A suspect, we're not talking about someone who has been tried and found guilty, we're talking about someone suspected of activities. But some of the things that make you suspicious of terrorism are having food, having more than seven days of food, missing fingers on your hand, having ammunition, having weatherproofed ammunition, having several guns at your house. Is that enough? Are you willing to sacrifice your freedom for liberty? I would argue that we should strike these detainee provisions from this bill because we are giving up our liberty. We are giving up our the constitutional right to have due process before we're sent to a prison. This is very... Isn't that a breath of fresh air? That's what the media says is radical. I tell you, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree there. That's Rand Paul, who I know behind the scenes. I know people that work with him. He's the real deal. He's just like his dad. And they demonize the daylights out of him. They demonize his dad. They twist everything he said or done against him. When the entire corrupt system is attacking somebody, you know they're good. If you're sick of this system, if you're sick of all this corruption, support Ron Paul. Now, uh, we've also got the clip of uh, Lieberman, just incredibly creepy, where he's talking about, we don't want you to know what the torture is. We want you to be scared. I mean, that's terrorism right there. We don't want anybody to know you've been arrested, and we don't want anybody to know what our interrogation methods are, because we want you to be scared. When a member of Al-Qaeda or, or a similar associated terrorist group is captured, I want that person to be terrified about what's going to happen to them in American custody. I, I want them uh, not to know what's going to happen. I want that, that, that the terror that they inflict on others to be felt by them as a result of the uncertainty of not knowing that they can look uh, on the internet and find exactly uh, what our interrogators are going to be limited to. The law of the land is that if you choose to help Al-Qaeda, you've committed an act of war against your fellow citizens and you can be held as an enemy combatant for an indeterminate period of time so we can gather intelligence about what you may have done or about what you know about the enemy. Can you think of anything more creepy than these corrupt senators that have helped the foreign banks gut this country and sent all our jobs overseas, who use this national security state to operate in secrecy, and now they want to start arresting us and dragging us off in the night, and no one knows where we went? Can you imagine the abuses that are going to come from this? I mean, it doesn't get any more textbook than this. And by the way, Rand Paul showed his intelligence earlier when he was mentioning the missing fingers, uh, you know, things like that, we've broken I mean, uh, the news, been sent the manuals, where they tell tattoo artists, gun shops, uh, fertilizer places, you name it. If a farmer comes in and has burns on their hands, go ahead and call the police on them. Uh, or if, if uh, they tell uh, work people, uh, telephone repair people, you name it, that go in your house, realtors, that if they see guns, go ahead and call Homeland Security on you. 
I mean, what's next? If you see a ham sandwich in somebody's refrigerator, call the cops on them. It's this idea that the general public is bad and government is good when government is now run and hijacked by these criminal interests. It is mind-blowing to see this happen. Uh, last night, I uh, watched a film, Equilibrium, with C Christian Bale when I was jogging on the treadmill, and I woke up at like in the middle of the night freaked out by it because this was only made like a decade ago and the whole movie is telescreens on the wall saying watch your neighbors and government trying to force drug the public and black uniforms and I'm like this is exactly what the system's doing it's like they've watched some cheesy B dystopic science fiction movie and said this is a good plan let's go with this the only thing we've got left is the Second Amendment and the First Amendment, which the American people are still exercising openly, which is good. And between those two prongs, that pincer attack, if we boldly stand up and tell the truth with our First Amendment, we can avert using the Second Amendment. Now, uh, here's the numbers. A record 1.5 plus million instant FBI checks. And on average, they did a survey, the average person was buying 2.1 guns. Now, again, instant FBI checks are only from federal firearms dealers. It's estimated that around 30% more guns are sold from individuals to other hands. There's 400 million guns in this country. So you double 2.1 guns sold, you're talking about 3 million plus guns sold with 1.5 million background checks. Three million guns sold in December alone on top of the 400 million guns in this country of new manufacture. This is an armed camp, and I think that's beautiful because nothing equalizes the good guy versus the bad guy like guns. You take Mexico, great people, a lot of courage, total slaves because the military and the government has the guns and the citizens are totally barred from owning firearms. So only the criminals and the gangs and the government are armed. The answer here is arming more people as an equalizer. And I saw a national survey last week of why these gun sales were so high. And the average person said government collapse, uh, civil unrest, and they went on to say, we don't trust the government. So what does that say to the system? The people are arming against the government, just as the founding fathers said we should do. People are finally figuring out what the liberty teeth are for, as George Washington called them. Now, I'm not calling for some violent confrontation. We need to reach out to the military and police, who, by the way, are good people on average and are waking up. But what, what message is that to the pushers of the NDAA and the rest of them? What message is that to you that the people are doing this? This is not going to be like Germany or Russia or China where people were not armed. This is not going to go well for you. And you may think you're going to be able to finagle some civil war and sit offshore while this happens and get away with it. When we get America back, globalists, you're going to be brought to justice. And if you make us go through some horrible civil war and some giant war crime operation, where, where your people commit war crimes, you're going to be doubly brought to justice. Back off now. Abandon your eugenics program. Abandon your new world order. Because you can look at the facts. You can listen to Brzezinski a year and a half ago in 2010. Tell you at your own CFR, you're going to lose. Your whole new world order plan was based on us being in the dark. You're not going to be able to get away with this when we have your whole playbook. And we know what order the plays are going to be played in. Checkmate. You might be able to kill some of us individually, but you're not going to kill this idea of freedom. You're not going to get away with this. You're in check. If you continue to move in the direction you're going, you're checkmate. I don't want all of these horrible things to happen that are clearly going to unfold for anybody that can study geopolitical movements if this continues down this road. I'm not saying bring it on, let's have a big war. I'm way past tough guy point. I'm way past being macho and saying let's have a fight. There are alternatives to fighting. And I know a lot of you in the power structure are very concerned and you've read the tea leaves. You realize you're not going to win this. Who would want to win it anyways? 
the nightmare world that the worst of you that run the elite system have determined for the rest of you is a foregone conclusion? Don't just let this happen. Don't let World War III with Iran happen. Don't let all this genocide happen. Don't let a domestic police state happen. Let's not go down this road. Let's not fight a war where we all lose. Let's de-escalate now. Let's de-escalate now. All right, let's continue here with really some comic relief. Uh, it's comical to those of us that are awake. You know, watching Obama say he's against a bill that he really wrote the subsection for and then saying he'd veto it, but then signing it. I mean, once you're conscious of the liars, it's like, that's cartoonish. It's like watching the... Uh, the magician stage everything in slow motion. You can see the sleight of hand. But the system is targeting people that are unconscious. And so that's why all this stuff works. But Huntsman, who works for Obama, is a total establishment ringer, is a total New World Order minion. He's put out a new ad with Twilight Zone music in the background, making fun of Ron Paul, implying that he's a total kook. Because why? Ron Paul quotes George Herbert Walker Bush calling for a new world order and quotes the fact that Skull and Bones and their own documents wants a new world order as if you are idiots and don't know that they've announced a new world order in Europe run by the banks and a Goldman Sachs dictatorship. So we're going to go ahead and play the ad and then I'm going to come back and decipher it here. They also show a clip of Ron Paul saying that Hamas was set up by Israel. Israel admits that, but the system is acting like he's a kook for admitting that the sky is blue or that grass is green. Here is the new desperate ad where they also use a clip from my film Endgame where Ron Paul talks about the New World Order. Here it is. The assumption is that this guy is like your crazy uncle, but you never expected your crazy uncle to get this far. The problem with him is that he's got some very sound points, but then he's kind of, I don't know, in other areas, scary. All I can say is, you know, back it up to when Ron Paul comes. Again, this is just too much. I've got to analyze each piece of this. You've got some teleprompter reader on Fox News who sits up there and dictates to you, this is your crazy uncle. Yeah, that predicted everything that's happening 30 years ago. And then, and then you're going to be peer pressure driven this is what they think of you. And because he says this is your crazy uncle, who they told you for six months couldn't win, now the front runner, so they're panicking. They're trying to dictate your reality. Then they cut to Ron Paul on a TV show who's when he's asked about Skull and Bones. ABC News got footage 10 years ago, pull it up, of Skull and Bones where they were worshiping Satan. Look, I know that's crazy, but it's not Ron Paul that did it. He was just asked about it, and he said, yeah, they're doing it. Then they cut to him talking about CFR Trilateral Commission. The CFR every week puts out articles on their website calling for global government. And they've got almost every member of Congress as a member. And it's a British intelligence outfit set up by British intelligence to help take this country back over in 1922 at Pratt House in New York. So, well, I'm sorry. Let's just get back to the rest of the Twilight Zone ad. Here it is. All I can say is, you know, people have written about this, and the Skull of Bones is a secret order of, of Yale, and then the uh, proposition is that people uh, are there groomed for the Trilateral Commission and the CFR, and therefore they will then be in uh, positions of great influence in our government. Uh, President Bush uh, said that the New World Order was uh, in, 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 in tune, and that's what they were working for. 600,000 Americans died in a senseless civil war. You, you, you buy the slaves and release them. How much would that cost compared to killing 600,000 Americans? If you look at the history, you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel. Have you ever read about the reasons they attacked us? They, they attack us because we've been over over there. We've been bombing Iraq for 10 years. Are you suggesting we invited the 9-11 attack, sir? The Israelis are there. The United States is there. All these countries. China has nuclear weapons. Why wouldn't it be natural that they might want a weapon? There'd be, internationally, they'd be given more respect. Tune in next week for more of Ron Paul. Yeah, tune in to somebody who actually talks straight. 
Now, uh, I'm going to get to some video clips of world leaders calling for a new world order just in the last year or so. And then I'm going to get to Israeli newspapers and U.S. newspapers admitting that Israel set up Hamas. In fact, the Wall Street Journal headline is exactly what he said, that Israel was involved in setting it up. Actually, they, they set the whole thing up. The source of that is every Israeli newspaper. But again, they think Americans are dumb. And, and, and the question is, are you? Uh, let's go ahead and show, though, um, uh, my crew pointed out that Huntsman has another attack piece like this and turned the comments off. Uh, but uh, as of this being out less than 24 hours, there was 860 thumbing down the video, disagreeing with it, and 165. So that's basically eight to one in favor of Ron Paul. And then dude just popped in my ear and said, that means YouTube's going to put it at the top. Yeah, yeah, right. If, exactly. Whenever it's pro-establishment, YouTube does put it to the top with their rigged game. Now, let's go ahead and go to these clips of world leaders, Henry Kissinger and others, admitting that it's a new world order, which means global government. Here are some of those clips that, that, that you know, world leaders call for a new world order. George Herbert Walker Bush in something like 57 speeches. I know because we collated it all in Invisible Empire, our film, Jason Burmas directed, I produced. The, I told Burmas, I said, this film's three hours long. Half of it's people saying world government, new world order. And he said, well, they deny it exists. And I'm like, okay, put it in there. But, but here they are admitting world government over and over again means new world order. New world order means world government, corporate run. We're now under it. And, and he's the bad guy. Like this guy talks about reality. He's bad. I mean, it is so mind boggling. Here it is. I've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. I think its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, oh, huh. where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Now we can see a new world coming into view, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. But it is the awareness itself that will drive the change. And one of the ways it will drive the change is through global governance and global agreements. But the many business leaders who have been present here uh, are among those taking leadership in other ways. Yet these problems can be overcome by a joint effort in our, and between our countries. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. This is collective action, people working together at their best. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. And then it's going to be another big show tonight because I've got to respond to all this bull. And the problem is we have hundreds of these clips where they admit the state is God. What is the new world order? The state is God. That's what it means. And the globalists using these crises to set up their global governance, their new world order. And so Ron Paul gets up and says, yeah, George Bush the first called for a new world order. And they're like, oh my God, it's, it's crazy. Oh, oh, let's run $2 million worth of ads in two days in Iowa. He, he, he says there's a new world order. He's dangerous. He, he, he repeated what the president said in State of the Unions. Listen, he's crazy. He's like your crazy old uncle. This is the bad man. He's not for the new world order. He, he's, he's not a good person. Now, let's continue. You saw that little short clip where they said he thinks Hamas was set up by Israel. Well, that's funny. 
I happen to have Haratz right here in front of me. And it says that Israel right here set up Hezbollah. Israel created Hezbollah. There it is right there. Israel created Hezbollah. Let, let's continue. I have another uh, quote right here. Uh, this is out of the Wall Street Journal. People may have heard of that. How Israel helped spawn Hamas. Oh! But can we cue that video when we're done up of the kook, Ron Paul, the evil one who imagines that George Herbert Walker Bush calls for a new world order, that imagines that Israel helped set up Hamas as a counter to Iran and Hezbollah? Oh, but wait, I don't stop there. You know, we've got more of these articles. But I mean, I mean, cue that up. Let's just see part of that ad again, where, where, where he talks about Hezbollah. Oh, yeah, let's fast forward past that. We're, we're queuing that up right now. Just play the whole ad. The time it takes to queue it up, we'll get it. Here it is. So you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel. Have you ever read about Oh, let's hold on. Let, you want to show it again? Because again, I mean, you know, I just got the Wall Street Journal and the Harats here, but they're bad too. They're, they're, they're crazy old uncles. I guess George Herbert Walker Bush is a crazy old uncle. I mean, because he's just a crazy old uncle mentioning what somebody said. In fact, I'm so angry right now. How dare you, Ron Paul? Make me sick. I mean, Ron Paul walked out one day and saw a blue sky, and he said, blue sky. And everybody went, my God, blue sky, he's crazy. Well, I'm a trendy. If the government says the sky is black, I believe him at high noon. They say it's orange at high noon. You buy the slaves and release them. How much would that cost compared to killing 600,000 Americans? If you look at the history, you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel. Have you ever read about the reasons they attacked us? They, they attack us because... Okay, I think I've shown that three times, but... Uh, the system counts on you being petty, being thin-skinned, being very, very shallow. And, and it is wild that Israel created Hamas. Because we're told, give all our liberties up because they're going to kill us every minute. You know, the evil Hamas. And then, and then if you mention, hey, Israel and other governments created, our government created Al-Qaeda, they're like, oh, shut up. And then national security advisors, former government chiefs write books bragging that they created Al-Qaeda, and you can buy the book and go, look, Brzezinski wrote this. It's on this page. Here, David Rockefeller wrote this book and admits he wants global governance and the end of the family. And it's like, shut up. You're a cook. Folks, only waking up and facing reality is going to save our society. It's that simple. Okay, let's continue on the Ron Paul news. There's a LewRockwell.com uh, article out. Beware of GOP false flag chicanery at Iowa caucuses because... Anonymous, another anonymous group the government can basically run, just a cutout group, says they're going to attack. And, and we told you this weeks ago when they first announced it. I said, watch, the government will come in and oversee the caucus vote and will count it at a secret location. And sure enough, uh, it has been announced. It will be the votes for Ron Paul will be counted at a uh, secret location now. And uh, if you uh, don't trust known confirmed liars, you must be with Al-Qaeda, who works for the CIA. Uh, but let's continue now with some of the other news on the Ron Paul front. Latest Iowa poll has Ron Paul in first place. But the Republicans are going to count it secretly because there was an outside threat, like Hamas, maybe. Um, and uh, latest Iowa Poll has Ron Paul in first place, but doesn't matter. Politico, when he's in first place, came out and said he was in third place. And they waited till the media, the controlled whore media, all ran with Ron Paul plunging before they corrected it and said, sorry, he's in second or first, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and they just said, forget that whole situation. That's at Infowars.com. Politico botches poll results to downgrade Ron Paul. Kind of like people botch bank robberies when they get away with the money. It's all accidental, of course. But uh, here's another one. U.S. civilians are now helping decide who to kill with drones. This is all part of people 10,000 miles away, zit-face, hot-pocket-eating 
tech heads now get to kill whole wedding parties to kill one, quote, terrorist who never got a trial. And so they're getting humans completely out of the military. It's all just going to be drones killing people at a distance, including American citizens. The absolute, total and complete cowardice of it all. Now we're going to go to Ron Paul's uh, final ad before the Iowa caucus. Believe Ron Paul releases closing argument ad. We're going to get to that in a moment. But first, I want to get to a report that's been several weeks in the making. And uh, that, of course, is the terrorism death stats. Because I know it's fun, like a campfire story, to sit around and have granddad, when you're seven, tell you about the boogeyman while you're roasting hot dogs. But the boogeyman isn't really real. Government's killing people, though, are. The, the, that's the real monsters. I understand it's fun to get into fearing the Muslims and getting all scared and everything while the government leaves the borders wide open and ships Muslims in faster than you can, uh, you know, say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. But I thought we would just compile some basic numbers here so that those of you that get all upset and tribally worried and are willing to give up all your rights and have your children secretly arrested and gang raped at Abu Ghraib to keep you safe from Al Qaeda that our government created and Israel created Hamas. I understand it's still scary though, it's fun to get scared. I thought we'd actually go over some terrorism statistics from the United States and some other countries. Uh, there is a uh, report here broken down uh, by different scientific journals that we'll uh, put on screen that terrorism in the United States from 1970 uh, to 2007, that's Scientific American, were 3,292 deaths. That's a 1 in 3.5 million chance in the actuary over those decades. Uh, but, but your whole way of life, your Bill of Rights, your Constitution killed because the Al-Qaeda Easter Bunny uh, might get you. So there it is. You got a better chance per year being killed by champagne corks popping. We're going to go over those numbers. Or wild dogs or a bolt of lightning or dying in the swimming pool or electrocuting yourself. More people were killed each year by flying champagne corks than bites from poisonous spiders. One of nearly two dozen champagne accidents, fatalities a year, more than a third occurred at weddings. Well, the obvious thing is ban weddings or have pot-bellied people there in blue outfits that grab your child's genitals and your, have sex with your, your bride on the cake because, or, or maybe rob everybody's bags like the TSA does uh, because, again, the Al-Qaeda is so scary. Again, government's got to protect you from every threat out there. So let's go through leading causes of death annually versus terrorism. Tobacco, 430,700 annual deaths or one in 726. All accidents in the U.S. in 2007, 119,000, or one in 2,500. So all accidents is a one in 2,500 chance from 310 million people. Terrorism, one in 3.5 million. But again, I'm not patriotic if I don't literally urinate my pants right now and just shake and say, Ron Paul's a kook. He doesn't want foreign banks that own military contractors bankrupting the country to launch wars worldwide to take over countries' resources that we don't even get any of. Let's, let's go back to uh, alcohol. 110,640 annual deaths are one in 2,827. Adverse reactions to prescription drugs, 32,000 annual deaths. And that is a government number. The numbers we've got, it's 300,000. But let's just go with 32,000. Much better chance than terrorist. Suicide, 30,575 annual deaths, most of them troops. That's the highest number now of the group. Versus 3,292 deaths over 30 years. 37 years, excuse me. Uh, continuing. Homicide, 18,272 annual deaths. All licit and illicit drug-induced deaths, 16,926 annual deaths. Not one death from marijuana, I should add. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, 7,600 annual deaths. 
I know a, several parents whose children died from bad interactions from over-the-counter drugs. Do they have people there sticking their hands out your pants at Walgreens to keep you safe? No, they don't. That's about prisoner training. Now, let's look at some terrorism numbers. In Iraq, a hotbed of sectarian violence that they call terrorism, from 03 to 08, 13, 113,000 616, or 1 in 1,150. Terrorism in Northern Ireland, from 1970 to 2007, Scientific American, 1,758, or 1 in 43,000. Terrorism in the United Kingdom, from 70 to 07, 2,196, or 1 in 1,100,000. Terrorism in the United States, already mentioned this, from 1970 to 07, 3,292, 3, 1 in 3.5 million. Terrorism in Canada kills 1 in 3.8 million. Terrorism in Great Britain, 1 in 5.2 million. Now let's look at some of the animal numbers here. Animals. Shark killed one person. We gotta have TSA out there on little rafts keeping everybody safe. And sticking their hands down the bathing beauty's pants. A hippo in Africa killed 100 to 150 annual deaths. Well, gotta ban those. Gotta have guys in blue uniforms out there keeping you safe. Elephants, 300 annual casualties. Tiger and lion, 800 annual casualties. They gotta ban tigers in India. Unnatural deaths. Coconut allergy, or coconuts falling and hitting you in the head. Combined number, 150 per year on average. Cut all coconut trees down, have men in blue uniforms, sticking hands down pants. That'll keep you safe. Champagne cork, 24 annual deaths on average in the U.S. Vending machines, we've got a, a graphic of that. They have bait and tackle vending machines. I don't think they've killed anybody, but... Vending machines, two annual deaths. Got to ban all vending machines then. Fireworks kill 11 annually, or 1 in 340,733. Sources, scientificamerican.com, cancer.org, Florida Museum of Natural History, about.com, and a bunch of others. Centers for Disease Control. Yeah, there's the uh, deadly shark. I mean, hell, if sharks kill about six people worldwide every year, ban swimming. In large swaths of Florida now, they ban swimming for months because a shark might bite your foot. I mean, this nanny state excuse that they've got to take over your life and take all your liberties and take all your freedoms to keep you safe, it is a crock of unmitigated bull. Now listen, the truth isn't pretty, it's ugly. And I'm in here teleprompter free. I told the guys, I said, listen, it's first of the year here, you know, second day of the new year. Let's just do a 30 minute show. We got another interview coming up with Catherine Austin and Fitz after the break. I'm totally exhausted, but I've just done basically an hour here tonight to break down the facts. I hope you'll appreciate this information and get it out to everybody you know, because the truth will set us free. The people perish for lack of knowledge. I've only covered the, the, the top one or two percent of the news we had today. It's that big, reality is that huge. Don't believe everything I say, but research what I say and find out it's far worse than I could even relate to you. Reality is so much more complex than what is regurgitated on the big four networks every night with the same news story in the same order with the same sponsors. That simplistic centralization is there to sell you tyranny and slavery. And that entire establishment media system is bombarding and attacking Ron Paul because he is only one manifestation or one focal point of this global awakening that's taking place. Here's the new campaign ad. We've got it at Infowars.com if you want to get it out to folks. Believe Ron Paul releases closing argument ad. Watch Paul's final message before Voting begins. All right, here's the Ron Paul ad. We'll be right back with Catherine Austin Fitz.
America is in trouble. Washington is a disgrace. Government has become too big. It's overtaxing, overspending. We need to change direction. We really need change. We can't afford to make the same mistakes we've made in the past. Mitt Romney's reputation as a flip-flopper. He went the other way when he got paid to go the other way. There is need for economic stimulus. It's about serial hypocrisy. This election is about trust. There's been one true consistent candidate, and that's Dr. Ron Paul. Ron Paul has been so consistent from the very beginning. He seems like a more honest candidate. He tells the truth about what he believes, whether you like it or not. He's never once voted for a tax increase, never once voted for an unbalanced budget. Ron Paul's plan is bold, cuts five departments. It's what we need. When he says he's going to cut a trillion dollars in the first year, I believe it. If you don't like how things are going and you're tired of politicians, he's something different. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Is the one we've been looking for. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. It was uh, between 1972 and 73, but it was still a lot of prejudice around this area. My wife was sick and I was trying to get some attention for her. Nobody came to check. They just left her there. Well, I believe I was left there because of the difference, uh, me being black and her being white. And every time I would say something to her head nurse, she would get pretty upset. And then she finally called the uh, Freeport Police Department, said I was harassing her. And I mean, I, I didn't know anything to do. Well, then Ron Paul come to my rescue. He just stepped in and went to work with my wife. And after he seen her, uh, I'd say no more than 10 minutes later, she had a stillborn boy child. And he said, as far as the bill, he would take care of everything, which he did. I never got a bill from the hospital or anything. And, he was a doctor of medicine and that's what he was doing, was practicing medicine and it didn't matter who and what and why. He was doing it because he think of one human being just as much as another. He's just a honest man and that's something we need now in this day and time. It's a lot of politics and no honesty. When you have honesty, well, People will try to do anything to blot you out. And that's what they will try to do to him, is blot him out because he will be honest. And they need more like him. Click here to donate to help get James' story broadcast on television. Welcome back. It's the first show of the new year uh, here on January 2nd, 2012. I'm your host, Alex Jones. Uh, we are uh, now joined by just an amazing analyst, Catherine Austin Fitch. She's a very successful investment advisor, managing member of Solari Investment Advisory Services and C Lane Advisory LLC. She's a successful entrepreneur, president of Hamilton Securities Group, investment bank and finance software developer. Uh, that's at the you know, top of the game. And former government official, assistant secretary of housing, federal housing commissioner, Bush One, investment banker, managing director, and member of the board of Wall Street firm, Dylan Reed & Co. I'm going to stop right there, but uh, you know, she definitely is the creme de la creme and just an amazing person to be able to have on to break down what's currently happening. But if you go back to interviews she did on radio 10 years ago, interviews she's done with us the last five or six it is incredible that everything she warned about broke uh, as mainstream news uh, in the 
following years after it. It, it has all basically broken loose. It's all basically happened. And so I wanted to recap what this New World Order is, who's behind it briefly, and then give us her view into the future of what she thinks is going to unfold. And we'll talk to her about the NDAA, uh, the situation with Iran, uh, and so much more. And of course, her website will be up on screen at solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I.com. Catherine, wonderful to have you with us. Alex, Happy New Year. It's great to be back. We're in the crazy 2012. I mean, off the top of your head, what do you think of 2012? What do you think is coming up this year? Actually, I'm, I'm kind of an optimist for 2012. You know, it's in one sense, we have things getting crazier and weirder because the beast is coming out of the closet. But the good news is the beast is coming out of the closet and people can start to see it and take action. So for me, it's I, I feel very good about 2012 because we're going to start to deal with the problems that we have been, you know, keeping under the ground for a very long time. Define so, uh, define that beast because there's a lot of new viewers, and then, and then let's get into what you see that beast doing in the future. Well, we've had a group of people centralizing the economy, and, and they've been able to stay a little bit hidden because we bubble the economy. And now that the, the bubble is over and we're kind of in the debt trap, things have to be faced. So, in fact, for the last 500 years, we've been in an economic model, which I call the central banking warfare model. It was coined by, by James Turk. And the central banks print money, and then the military makes sure everybody keep, you know, takes the money and uses the money uh, while they access cheap natural resources. And so that model can't continue. It has to change, and, and you have a small group of people centralizing the economy who have a plan for how it's going to change. We're starting to see the outlines of that plan. Most of us don't like that plan. You know, we believe in freedom for the individual and, and, and the protection of individual and property rights. And so, you know, appalled as we are, we're now starting to act to, to make that change. And I think what, what I'm seeing all over the world, and I know you are because you're really at the hub, is a much greater consciousness of people saying, wait a minute, you know, we don't like this. You know, what's the plan? What's our plan? So I think there needs to be a global conversation about what's going on. And, and from that will emerge ideas of something that is both decentralizing and wealth producing. So uh, and, and we're just in the middle of that birth or we're just at the beginning of that birth. And I, for one, welcome the conversation. Well, Catherine, you brought up both uh, of the first questions I was basically going to ask you. And, <laughs> and that is, I am seeing the awakening that was already turbocharged exploding. And with the signing of the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, people are really waking up and apologizing to myself uh, and others now and really starting to click. So people are really coming out of that trance. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned that. I want you to expand on that. But also, the monster is out of the closet. Why is it so out of the closet now? Why would Lindsey Graham and others in, in the Senate say, you bet it's for citizens and we want to scare you? And, and he looked like he was on drugs or something. I mean, they really are going crazy in front of everybody. Well, I think I think let's break it up. You have different groups. You have the people who are in charge. And of course, my big biggest question is who's really in charge and why are they behaving this way? But, you know, one of the things that happens when you centralize, Alex, is that once you finish centralizing, there's a whole bureaucracy in the middle you don't need anymore. And I think one of the things we're seeing from things uh, like the National Defense Authorization Act provisions this year is, you know, all the guys up and down in the middle in a highly centralized system are terribly, terribly insecure. Um, and so, you know, you, we see them passing provisions like that because they're scared. It reflects insecurity. It doesn't reflect security because, you know, right now, if the U.S. budget has a five trillion dollar deficit and the, and the boomers are retiring and need their Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, how are you going to keep that going? Well, the global taxation that you need to keep the empire going is is greater and greater force and greater and greater control. And I think what we're watching is a is a is a very, um, uh, you know, an, an empire which is very spread and is a very uncomfortable position to be in those middle positions. And so it's an, it's an insecure empire, and I think it's one you kind of want to, you know, it's, it's fine to comment on it, but you don't want to get in a tussle with it. 
No, no. In, in fact, before we would, uh, did this show tonight, I shot a special report that's going to be out tomorrow where that's my central point is they're afraid is why they did the NDAA. That's right. why they said, yeah, we'll lock up citizens. It's an attempt. You know, the fact that they're dispensing with a velvet glove shows just how weak they are. Right. Well, think about it. In 1998, when I when I saw all the early stages of what was going on, whether it was the patenting of life and control of the seed supply and um, the manipulations in the oil markets and precious metals on and on and on the housing bubble, you know, I came to the conclusion that the only way I could explain all of these disparate acts and centralization was they're planning on depopulating. And I always tell the story of a wonderful portfolio strategist from London who flew in to see me and said, you know, can I meet you in the woods? And said, he said to me, the only thing I can conclude is they're planning on significant depopulation. I can't explain these different things. And I said, well, that's very interesting because that's the only thing I can come up with. But at that point, I came to the realization that I had to be prepared to live, you know, through a period where, in fact, that might be happening. And I think, uh, I think one of the reasons they're afraid is if, as people begin to realize what they're doing with the food supply, with water, with chemtrails, whatever, and you come to that realization, you know, you can get pretty ornery. <laughs> and I remember when the swine flu, you know, vaccine came out, that's when I decided, okay, I'm drawing the line. That's, that's when the guns come out. And, you know, this, this is a country that's highly, um, highly armed and highly ornery. So, so you can see why being a manager who's basically implementing policies that depopulate, why you would feel very insecure against the general population right now. Well, you are always right at the zeitgeist. That's what I covered before you came on with us tonight. Record gun sales, uh, probably around 300 million. They're not sure. There was 1.5 plus million in the month of December instant checks. That's only part of gun sales is through the regular system and they estimate that the average person bought 2.1 guns that's 3 million plus guns bought in one month all the so-called liberals i know now realize the government isn't their friend run by mega corporations they've all been buying guns and i'm not right. saying that's the answer to everything but at an instinctive level the people are arming to the teeth because they and, and they had a survey out last week they were saying why are you buying guns and the most common answer was imminent collapse, social unrest, and the government's criminal. Right. So, so they've, I mean, it's really a bunch of desperate Ceausescu types like Romania up there saying, fine, we'll just arrest you all. But if they actually try to march the military and police off against the people, that's not going to go too well. Well, in fact, and I, I don't, you know, the, the one of the few groups I'm not afraid of right now is the military, because, you know, one of my questions is if things keep going the way they're going, or do we want the risk of a military coup, not because the military are being bad guys, but because the system is so irresponsible? Well, I know we've had the last two Joint Chiefs of Staff chairmen refuse to attack Iran. So now they've put Dempsey in, who sounds like he's... Uh, has a mental problem or or is a mental deficient. I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean. Right. I, I, no, 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 but you know, it's funny because the, if you if you look at who in the United States is a true believer in the Constitution, you know, a lot of those, a lot of that, of that loyalty to the Constitution is within the military. <laughs> so we're in a funny situation where the civil leadership is not committed to the Constitution, but a lot a lot of the people in the military are, and of course. The military, the funny thing about the military, Alex, is they have to deliver. And when the political leadership spreads them this thin, that's a very a nerve wracking position to be in because you're you're responsible for the whole thing. And make no mistake about it. You know, you bring down the dollar fast overnight and you can crash the whole globe. So um, well, let's talk about that then, because you've got the okay. military, as you know, giving more donations to Ron Paul than Obama and all the other dwarves combined on the Republican side, that's got to worry the system. So there's this paradox. They want to use the military against the people, but I do talk to the military. They are awake. That's why the, the MIAC and Homeland Security reports list the military as the, quote, number one enemy of the government. So it's very schizophrenic. <laughs> it's a bit, you know, it's a very unusual thing to talk about the military and the people being you know, aligned. And I, th I think, you know, the, the, the thing we have to understand at the heart of the whole machine is that 
We have a non-sustainable economic model. It's been the military's job to keep that non-sustainable economic model going. And now the fundamental issue is how do we change? And the reality is we've been centralizing in a way that, that destroys wealth. Now what we've got to do is we've got to build wealth. And, and the way to do that is to do it in a, in a decentralizing way. And the challenge that the leadership has is how do you keep the old cash flows pumping along while people figure out the new? And what I'd love to do, Alex, is I'd like to talk about some of the really um, positive developments that happened in 2011, which I think are important for people to pick up on. Yeah, I want to because do that. And, and then I want to look forward to uh, because you mentioned, you know, the ruling elite obviously wanting to cut off resources post-industrial world. Not, not to create a sustainable one, but just to totally basically get rid of much of the human labor because they don't need us anymore because they have machines and things. And then, you know, how you see those two things colliding. But yeah, let's talk about okay. some of the positive things that happened in 2011. Have you done any coverage of the maker movement? Uh, no, tell me about it. The maker movement is, is groups of people who are getting together and learning how to make stuff themselves. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, in fact, we had one. There's one wonderful uh, presentation I had an open source software developer who's doing sort of designs for the 50 pieces of machinery you need to run any community. And of course, one of the ways that communities have been drained is by you know getting the way that they drain the small farmers is you get on the sort of farm equipment treadmill. And the more we can make and do our own machines, it's very positive. You know, these are things that young kids can learn to do. There's no reason why, uh, you know, somebody, um, you know, in seventh and eighth grade can't learn how to make mom's toaster. So to me, the make, make, maker movement is very exciting. The, the, the uh, emphasis on fresh food and growing your own food is just exploding. Oh, sure. You're talking about getting back to the land, true local sustainability movement. Absolutely. And people learning how to machine again and uh, a big movement to build you know, uh, right. firearms. Well, the big thing we have needed for two decades now is to, you know, right now what we're doing is we're destroying small business. What we need to do is, is build small business. And so um, one of the things I am very hopeful of is more and more people see the beasts as they are. They start to say, OK, how can I start to circulate more capital locally? So I think the shift to bank locally has been very positive. Um, but the next step then is how do we build local equity markets? You know, don't send our money to Wall Street and beg for it to come back. Let's start to circulate it locally and let's start to, to support the small businesses where we are because that's how we're going to create new jobs. And one of the things we've seen is the beginning, you're starting to see the word introduced into the lexicon of it's called advanced manufacturing. And believe it or not, with some of the developments and things like 3D printing, we could see a lot of manufacturing come on back on shore. Now, it's going to be not labor intensive, but there's no reason that small manufacturers um, in throughout America can't start to compete with much, much bigger companies. So um, robotics and advanced manufacturing can make a, a tremendous difference in the U.S. economy over the next 20 years. Now, 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 just backing up what you're saying, uh, this isn't just some fad or pie in the sky hype you're talking about. There is a yeah. giant movement towards organic right. farming, a giant uh -huh. movement towards uh, organic milk, a giant move towards local communities as people really figure out how fun it is to buy local, how to produce huge communities where I live, especially the middle class and upper middle class, uh, but also working class folks are getting into this. But And, and, and to prove that that's so central, and is is actually where it's at. The system, as you know, is coming in, targeting Amish, uh, organic milk producers, small manufacturers. The right. system is threatened by buying locally and being self-sufficient. Why is this centralizing system so threatened by it? Well, I think there are a couple reasons. First of all, Alex, agriculture, the cash flows related to the to the to the production and distribution of food is an enormous part of any economy. Um, so that's number one. And so if you can consolidate that into large corporations, you can make a lot of money, but you can also, you know, it's all part of centralizing economic control. But there's another issue, and that is for many, many decades, the dollar has been the, the global reserve currency, and there's been great economic and financial benefit to everybody in America by enjoying the wealth that comes as a result of that. Now, 
to, to have a global reserve currency, you need to control a global asset, and that global asset has been oil. Um, and I think one of the reasons you're seeing such a move to control the, the seed supply, to patent life, to control the food supply, is because if we're going to have a new global currency, we need a different asset than oil, particularly because energy technology, we know that energy technology exists that can replace fossil fuels. So if that energy technology is going to see the light of day or practical application, then, then you need something else to replace the bolster. And that's why they want to go to GMO. Right. And I think one of the reasons you, you want GMO, um, uh, you know, put aside, there may be some sort of geophysical weather issues, but that, but I think you want, that's the source of, of total control and total financial control and oil doesn't do it. And so I suspect it's eating food. Now, if you look at what that does in terms of, of centralizing the economy, it's devastating. So many small farms have been put out of business in this country, not because they're not economic or productive, because in fact, technology, Alex, should decentralize, not centralize the way it's been used. It's because of the food safety rules. And that's why this um, Christmas, our, every year we have a donation from Solari to a sort of worthy cause. Our donation was from the Consumer to Farm Legal Defense Fund because at the heart of freedom, um, there are a couple of legal issues which are at the heart of freedom. And one of them is absolutely defending the right of, um, of farmers and consumers to get together and eat whatever food they want. Sure, there's an all-out assault against lemonade stands, Amish farmers, people selling <laughs> tomatoes on the side of the road, as you know, uh, because it is right there at the heart. And just like 15 years ago, you couldn't find organic food on store shelves. Now it's supplanting, you know, all the toxic food, uh, or at least the establishment's trying to claim they're organic now. That shows the power of voting with our dollars. And I yes. know that that is a drum that you have beat, and you really have written detailed reports, video reports. They're all on the Solari website. And so there is hope in all of this. Uh, shifting gears into a few of the other solutions. Okay. Okay, so so I think I think circulating, uh, learning how to circulate uh, capital locally and through networks. So let's get our equity capital moving, and and let's get it possible. Let's switch the economics for a small business startup. Part of that is this advanced manufacturing. Um, I had an activist. I was in a conference in Switzerland, and one of the one of the activists told me that the Office of Naval Intelligence has hired him because they want to. Um, they expect to need. Um, in the next 10 years, 400,000 robotics engineers in America alone. So I can't under, underestimate, I just don't underestimate the importance of, of advanced manufacturing explosives. You're talking about the humans that work on the robots is, is going to be the next big growth area. Right, the engineers. Um, but but what, that, what that means is that um, manufacturing, very sophisticated manufacturing can be done by very small companies. So don't underestimate the opportunity for, for business and startups, you know, at a community level by understanding what's happening there and doing something about it. A lot can be brought back on shore. All right, let's shift gears back into the other area and you can finish any other solutions you'd like. Okay. But, but specifically, why do the global controllers, you said you spent a lot of time finding out who they are. A, in a nutshell, who are they? Uh, and why do they want to reduce population? Why do they want to suppress, obviously, de well, they'd have to decentralize if they wanted society to actually be healthy, but they'd rather centralize and just get rid of most people because that gives them control. I mean, that's well, my boil down, but, but I mean, who are they and what is their end game? So people understand here, what we're facing. Here, here's the $64,000 question, and I just did an interview with Daily Bell, which in fact you put up on your site, Alex, and I asked this question, who's in control? I have spent my entire life trying to figure out who's running things and why they're doing what they're doing, and I, I don't know the answer. And I don't think anybody knows the answer. I mean, I, I've dealt at higher levels of Washington and Wall Street and internationally, and I have never met, with rare exception, a person who wasn't a prisoner of the model. Why is that? And I think if, if any question needs to be asked and answered in 2012, it's that question. Because I think things are frighteningly centralized and really, we really don't understand who is control, in control. That's number one. The other thing is, you know, one of the most wonderful movies to describing that control, I think, is Eyes Wide Shut by Stanley Kubrick. And, um, you know, what, what we're describing is a group of people who have 
the power to act with impunity, to kill with impunity, and who literally operate and live outside and above the law. And until you understand that issue, address that issue, there are no solutions. So I think we, we need to, you know, we need to dig that out in 2012. And I don't think we know the answer. I think part of that question is understanding that the private corporations through the black budget have been able to finance advanced weaponry and technology that, that most people can't fathom exists. And, you know, they've been able to finance and build with digital technology a, a matrix, a literal matrix. And, um, and that has to be dealt with. So I think that's the issue for 2012. Who's really running things? What is their technology? What's their end game? And how do we build a new alignment? Because I, I don't think depopulation is the answer. I think their global vision of, uh, you know, a carbon tax and um, and patented seed supply is, you know, it's a, it's a it is a slavery state. You know, your expression of prison planet is very prescient. And, um, you know, so so we're not planning on having a prison planet. And I think that's the discussion that's going to emerge. But it it starts with saying these guys are really that dark and they're really that centralized. And, and we need to emerge a different plan. Well, I mean, uh, the 6,000 super class is pretty heavy information uh, that Rothkopf, the head of the, the Kissinger Group, wrote about you know, four or five years ago. It was a best-selling uh, book he put out. He describes it as 6,000 super technocrats that know their specialties, and then they basically uh, work for subsidiary corporations of the big six global mega banks. And so... Uh, there are the big six mega banks. You, you see a Bilderberg Group meeting out of 130 people, 65, 70 or more are Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. And from my research, it is a technocratic eugenics body that the British royalty and the Dutch royalty funded. Hitler was a spinoff of that. They had to shut down because he went too fast. And you've got these mega banks that then finance a centralization model and the cosmology excuse for just being predatory psychopaths is, well, there's too many humans. That's just kind of the, the rationale. But then they, they don't even really follow their larger plan. It, it, it's, it's just mainly a giant system of domination. Well, but, but let me mention a couple things because there, there has grown up in the bubble of the last 20 years an arrogance that there wasn't before. But to the extent that I've dealt with the people in that group, I've found a great deal of enlightenment and a lot of fine people who also f felt that they were a prisoner of the system. And what I will say is that I have found the corruption to be ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And and what you see at the top level is a real fear of people at the bottom level and not believing it's possible to come into some alignment, which is also financially and economically sustainable. In other words, they don't see a way to stay in a leadership position and get us from here to there. No, so, I get it. I mean, I get it. Every revolutionary is a secret aristocrat. That's their view. <laughs> they, they think that anybody who's fighting their structure just wants the power. And there, are, and there is the unwashed masses, and there are a lot of terrible people in the blue collar, white collar, you know, uh, mid and lower levels. I get all that. It, right. and, and, and then so the ruler's view is we've got to go ahead and be dark and evil so we can control it because there's something 10 times worse waiting if we don't. And I agree with what you just said. Humans really are individuals, but we form colony groups. And it's kind of like Kissinger talked about, it's a wild beast out of control individually, there are even a lot of people in the power elite that I've talked to off record as a journalist. You know, they say it's off record, so it is off record. They don't like what's happening. They're upset by it. And they're saying, look, we're not all bad. This is like a system that's self-fulfilling. And so there is some tr truth to what some would say, well, we consume too much, but then that gets co-opted as a way to just tax people and shut down basic human activity. Right. So and, and, so the problem is there's always some really corrupt individual who will take any good thing you try to do and twist it for their own gain so that there's the fact that corrupt people won't ever follow any decent rules. And so they always seem to govern the decision. And the worst then becomes the trailblazer in the development of the species. I mean, I'm ranting. I'm trying to answer your question. No, 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 it's good. But I think, you know, what we need in 2012 is we need power. So the, the fundamental issue is, well, since we don't know who's really in charge and why they're behaving like this, is, is 
is we need to get power over our circumstance. And power starts with saying, you know something? I believe that there is a way to, to decentralize and do so in a wealth creating way. And I refuse to be part of the, the madness. So I'm going to shift and I, I don't control anybody else, but I do control myself. So I'm going to become more coherent. I'm going to be, I'm going to function in a way where I make my money by doing something that's both decentralized and wealth producing. And as every one of us does that, and every one of us becomes more resilient and starts to make the change ourselves. That shift in consciousness, Alex, can shift everything because this is so centralized, which means if we act, you know, if we act by shifting our own behavior, our own money, our own actions, our own transactions, there's no target. They don't have a, you know, they don't have a way to shoot against us, if you will. And so a lot of the change has to come from massive cultural and financial change as we change the way we live. So simply put, we have to change ourselves. It's an inside job. We've got to start actually voting with our dollars, building things locally, creating, and that will build a parallel system. You know, the centralizers, they built their system parallel and then used government regulations and corporate largesse to transfer the old system to them. They've been waging war against a decentralized system. We just have to build new decentralized systems and they'll never be able to control it. They'll never be able to control it. If we, you know, part of it is, is taking actions among ourselves. And, and the more we can circulate money and learn to circulate money among ourselves is great. If we start to pay attention to the municipal issues, so we're going to have to, you know, our local elections, please, God, this year, we care more about our, our local elections than the federal election, because this is a trench warfare that also has to happen at the state and local level. So, so the reality is, if we're willing to shift consciousness, you know, one of the things that science has shown is that our intention can change material reality. That's been proved. So, so if we're willing to shift both our consciousness, our actions and our transactions, then, then they are too few. Now, what we need is we need them to come out of the, the closet because transparency has to, um, has to show us who they are so we can withdraw support. In my lifetime, Alex, what I have seen among my family, my friends, those around me, is they continue to support these people and we have to decide are we going to you know are we going to support things which build up our wealth and power are we going to support the things that ultimately destroy our wealth and power it's our choice but we have to choose freedom is not free well but but now we get down to the end game we see that going along with the system before might short term be okay now if people continue to say yes 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 to this out of control hurdling juggernaut uh, it's going to destroy us. I mean, uh, to have them come out and say, we will secretly arrest citizens, we will torture you, we will do all of this, uh, is a wake-up call. But that's because we've gotten so deep into this. If people think the last year was crazy, I mean, I mean, how crazy is the next year going to get? Right. Although, you know, I'm not... I'm not particularly concerned about the FEMA camps or, or being targeted or any of those things, because if you look at how spread their resources are, you know, these are people who are spread enormously thin. And so, you know, and I come, but that's why I come back to what is decentralizing and wealth building. It's hard for me to imagine that somebody's going to arrest you and torture you for doing community gardening. So I think what they're afraid of is real, you know, riots and violence. So I, I don't think that capacity, I think that capacity is to put the fear of God in people, not because they oh, have- Oh, I agree with you. They, they admit the camps as they roll them out will be during the collapse for all the homeless to stay in. And then, oh, by the way, there's a stockade for troublemakers. That's in the emergency center's establishment act, exactly what we had surmised. Right. Exactly, they're not gonna just say, we're coming to get you in our black uniforms. It's gonna be, oh, we're here to help you. The army's here because things are collapsing in Illinois. Uh, in Louisiana, they have government state reps calling for troops as a way to save the public. You know, let let the system in. Uh, I totally agree with you uh, that that uh, that's how the uh, system is basically going to approach this. But they knew 
that as they imploded the economy, it would start causing the civil unrest. So yeah, they're afraid of it at the middle level, but the you know dark, uh, uh, you know, more sophisticated groups that are that are organizing all of this, they know full well. Take the IMF World Bank documents that Sticklitz, you know, when he quit, suddenly mm -hmm. got released 2002. It talks about the IMF riot, how once they implode economy, that's only phase one. They want the riots to further destroy confidence. They let the public burn themselves out over six months. Then they come in as the saviors, the bankers do, and buy it up for pennies on the dollar. Well, let's look at the, how the money works, Alex. If you look at what technology can do to increase productivity, and if you look at what markets could do to unleash just productive behavior in this country, for the last 50 years, the politics has been, let's pay people off with government money so they'll, let us, so they'll go along with doing things that are not productive, okay? And, and so we have now an economy that's highly dependent on government checks. Every local county in this country is unbelievably dependent on federal government checks for activities which ultimately in aggregate are not productive and don't build an equity building, you know, wealth building economy. Now, if, if instead you said, look, we're going to run things based on productivity and we're going to allow, we're going to integrate technology and, you know, something we're going to stop doing all the things that are destroying technology. So, I mean, productivity, if you look at the things that are making my life difficult or your life difficult as a successful entrepreneur from chemtrails being sprayed over our heads to unbelievably complex tax and regulations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so if we just take the handcuffs off, entrepreneurs can solve 90% of the problems in this country, particularly if they're allowed to use new technology. So there is no economic problem. We have a political problem. The politics are being run to shut down small business and to shut down entrepreneurship, to shut down learning by people. There, there is no economic problem. There's a political problem. That's the only problem. Well, that's we right. The monopoly men have government and mega corporations shutting down everything so they can consume consolidated and wrecking society. And we simply have to point out, I, I mean, in closing, look at this article right here. Uh, it says, reviving the world economy, stand back, I'm a central banker. And it shows <laughs> a patient on the table, so I guess a famous Rembrandt, and, but, uh, but uh, now he's got defibrillators. And of course, it's you know, the joke on the people looking at it is it's, it's a dead body. But he says, stand back, I'm a central banker. But you read the article, they imply the mega bankers are the ones that are going to fix this and that Larry Summers is going to fix it when they're the ones that got rid of Glass-Steagall. They're right. the Ponzi scheme operators who want to get everybody in debt to the stuff that they produced out of nothing. And now the whole world is held hostage, signed on to their garbage. But here they are in their own publications selling themselves as the savior. And so it's a propaganda war. We've got the truth. They've got yeah. the lies. But, but, but it, it isn't working anymore. I mean, earlier... I played a clip of Huntsman uh, putting on an ad making fun of Ron Paul, mentioning that, that George Herbert Walker Bush called for a new world order. There is a new world order. I mean, they can't just ridicule us anymore. It isn't working anymore, Catherine. It's called the break it, fix it. I break it and then I fix it. Then I'm the hero. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I agree it's not working, but the, the, the first step to real solutions, Alex, is when a broad group of, of, and it's not activists who get it, it's the people on the line. Make no mistake about it, the people who run this country are the people who get the trains out, you know, the people who keep the pipelines going. It's the people who do the day-to-day -day business of operations in this country. They're on the line. The reasons the unions had such a powerful impact is they changed the rules of what was going to go down on the line. And, and what has happened in the last year is the people people on the line who really run things day to day, the engineers, the doctors, the lawyers, you know, the, the, the baker, the, you know, candlestick maker. People, right. Those people have started to realize this is perverted and nuts and we need to do something. And that consciousness, when the people on the line decide, Hey, wait a minute, you know, I was in Tennessee once and the head of the Tennessee firearms pointed out um, that the number of gun permits had just passed the number of people who were the, you know, the voting population. So, so we're talking about a change of consciousness on the line, which is very, you know, those people are very quiet and, and very, you know, they're, they're just dealing day to day, taking care of their kids, taking care of their job. When they decide to change things, they have unbelievable power. And that's what we're going to see go into impact in 2012. I agree. And here's what I hope in closing, I pray 
that great, firearms are wonderful, I'm all about the Second Amendment, I'm all about defending ourselves if it comes down to that, but I'd rather not just sit back with the guns and the ammo as like our emotional salve uh, and, you know, that, well, if it ever comes to it, you know, I'm ready to go down a blaze of glory. As you said, I'd rather put the effort out now to create new industry, new media, new farming, new communications, new, new cultures based on right. uh, liberty that will be so exciting and sexy compared right. to the automaton New World Order Borg that everybody joins us. And we're seeing that right now with Ron Paul. We're seeing right. that across the board that, that, that really we are on the right track and that's why the system is panicking. Panicking. But in, in closing, I want your comment on that. What message should that send to the establishment that this isn't intimidating people, Lindsey Graham and, and uh, uh, you know, people like Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman shooting their mouths off about, yeah, we'll torture citizens and snickering like, like old warlocks on the Senate floor. Th that is the people I know. It's not scaring them. It's a waking them up, and they're out there buying firearms. And 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 so I don't think like Ceausescu in Romania. I don't think these old wicked men understand that they're only pissing people off, Catherine. Well, here's the problem. They're you know they're sort of one trick ponies, and they they keep playing their Lone Ranger trick, and it won't work. But there are younger people inside, and they're seeing the positive things go on, and and let's hope they can find ways of aligning and supporting them. Whether it's you know whether it's the maker movement, or whether it's crowdfunding, or whether it's uh, you know there's a lot of positive things going on, and so. It's, but it's going to be trench warfare, Alex. It's going to be fought out by getting the, the proper sheriff. It's going to be fought out at the municipality. We're going to have to get into the courts. This is trench warfare. Well, you're right. And uh, what, there's an 8.2% turnout in local county elections nationwide. And Travis oh, no. Yeah, yeah, 8.2. 8 and nationally, it, it, it varies, but it's normally about 55% turnout in the presidential because they make it sexy, they push it because it's always been controlled. Now with Ron Paul, they're going crazy because there's an okay, actual- so, so let me give you a suggestion. If you want to shut down the new world order, it's very it's very easy to do. 3,100 counties shut down the drug business, the illegal drug business and the and the mortgage fraud. You know, that's that's the source of a lot of their financing. You shut that down, you shut down. It's a, it's a whole new day. I agree, you decriminalize drugs. Uh, you, right. you, uh, you, you know, as you said, all of this, but, but I mean, my point is, if we just shifted and got 55% to get politically involved locally, then we would take things back. People complain in Austin that we have these kind of neoliberal fascists running things, but 8%, we have the 8% uh, are voting. What do you expect? You've got to get involved, well, but not just vote, you've got to run for office. Yeah, but here's what I find, Alex, because they have the ability to kill and bribe with impunity, I mean, we just gave them $12 trillion. So, so what I've seen at the local level is most people can be bought off relatively cheaply or scared. And I think that's why I think this shift of consciousness is so important because it's going to have to be a group effort. It, it can't just be one guy trying to get involved and getting picked off. We're going to have to, we're ha going to have to way to go about the local effort without getting picked off and bribed and tricked. Because the, the dirtiest game I've seen so far in this country is not the guys at the top. It's it's the local New World Order representatives enforcing, you know, no, enforcing I totally I totally agree with you. And of course, not just bribed or bought off or threatened, tricked is the key. They'll give right. somebody some little petty position that's a rubber stamp. And the average person isn't sophisticated enough to know that. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Well, so, for example, if if we can stop smart meters, that's another one. Stop smart meters. Um, because, you know, once they have a surveillance device on every home, the politics are going to change. And, you know, that's another point. The average person doesn't know. They really do track everything you do. It really yeah. is a surveillance system. Yep. Yep. That's that's the core. One of the core competitive edges of the guys who are centralizing is they have incredible intelligence on all of us that we pay for. So we pay for for all of their intelligence and database tools on tracking us and using that information to advantage themselves against us. 
And they have, us, as you said, pay for it in the price of the cell phone, the, the power bill. It's always built as a Trojan in the device. Just like when you use Google, you think, oh, I'm getting information. No, they're getting information on you. Well, I, I suspect one of the reasons they're worried, uh, you know, that the, the provision is in the Defense Authorization Act is as, as this consciousness continues, Alex, how are they going to get people to continue to pay their taxes? Because if the government is operating significantly outside the law and we're coming into tax season on April 15th and people are really hurting, you know, that's going to be a dicey one. One of the things I would love to see on April 15th is everybody just file an extension and say, you know, we're angry. Let's see how the election goes. We're filing an extension. And that way it's an extension, but, but, but it's six months, nothing's paid. Well, you ha you still have to pay your estimates, but I think if a large group of people just did that, it would show their power. It, it would certainly it would certainly send a message. Well, look, they must be getting desperate now. They admit, yeah, we want to censor the internet with the SOPA bill. Uh, I mean, it's wild. Catherine Austin Fitz, uh, what's the best website for people to visit? Solari.com slash blog is my blog I post every day and are, we're basically focused on what can help you build personal and financial wealth. All right. Solari.com. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Alex. Again, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. All right. That was an extended first kickoff uh, of the New Year uh, interview with Catherine Austin Fitz. Very thought-provoking information. Um, look, 99% of us or more that live here in this country and on this world. The U.S. and England are the global model of tyranny uh, and the takeover that is now happening. Your children, your grandchildren, but, 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 but you personally are going to be affected by what's happening. This is a very ruthless, very dark system, and, and, and it's all about making you dependent on that government job or that corporate job that's dependent on government contracts. And it's all about making you destroy somebody else or suck off somebody else so you can survive. It is a predatory, vampiric, uh, the best term I could use would be cannibalistic system. It's a system that destroys and contracts instead of builds. Because a, 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 a system that's building, where everybody can actually have unlimited wealth through technology and through ideas, that decentralizes. And that threatens the globalist. The globalists, with their sodium fluoride in the water and their deadly vaccines and the GMO, I saw an article today where you know trans fats are causing brain damage. Of course they are. That's an artificially you know created thing. It's designed to hurt your body. Uh, all the stuff is. This is just so ruthless. And these controllers have decided to tie in to maximum evil and go all the way so that they are ensured total domination. It is a scientific dictatorship. But the minute you face the full horror of what we're dealing with and that it isn't a screw up and man, they're idiots in government, those are just puppets in government. The controllers are not idiots. They know exactly what they're doing. The minute you're aware of that, the minute you realize there's no way out of this but defeating these people. And to do that, you've got to get educated. You've got to get informed. You've got to get out of their system. You've got to get awake. And you've got to reach out to others and unlock them. Once you flip the blinders off somebody, you're not telling them what to think. They're seeing it for themselves. And I love that bumper sticker, you know, if you're not mad yet, you're not paying attention. I want to say great job to the crew. We did four or five months of the TV show starting last year, I guess in September, September 1st. Uh, so September, October, November, December. Yeah, four months of the show. We're now going into, uh, I'm a little kid counting on my fingers. We're going into uh, uh, month number five here, thanks to your support. And you uh, that are members of PrisonPlanet.tv, uh, that pay the 15 cents a day or whatever, you are then financing, building a larger structure, getting more reporters, engaging in more analysis, more research, more investigative reports, and the transformation of this show into a really hardcore news show and other shows. And currently, this show is grabbed off PrisonPlanet.tv, where you, the members, see it first and uh, post it on YouTube and other channels, and hundreds of thousands, if not millions a week, um, see the show. And this is just phase one, the radio show that took me 16 plus years to build. It's reaching three million a day. The websites are reaching over a million a day. 
We're re reaching more than 15 million people every week. This whole news division of what we're doing will also grow very quickly to that level thanks to your support. So there is no place where there's a bigger bang for your buck than, than funding our operation and, and going to InfoWars.com and buying the books, the videos, and the rest of it. Because of what you're doing, we're building something here very, very special that is at the very tip of the spear, the very cutting edge of this, this, this process of awakening and shattering this whole fake left-right paradigm and, and really boiling it down to liberty and tyranny, centralization versus decentralization. This is a bold experiment. And it is humanity and our species struggling against a group of aberrant humans uh, who are basically operating like a cancer in the body politic and who threaten to destroy our entire civilization. We've got to race in there and face them down and get in their face. And like she said, quit caring, uh, quit caring people say or do uh, and just engage the corruption at point blank range and know that there are other people doing the same thing in your area. That's why it's so important to wear your colors openly, whether it's an InfoWars.com shirt or a Ron Paul shirt uh, or a bumper sticker, so that you get, get, get to begin to see how many other people around you are awake as well. Then you're not alone anymore, and you realize that our numbers are growing exponentially. Okay, that's it for another teleprompter-free edition of the news. Uh, and God willing, we'll be back tomorrow night, 7 o'clock Central, 8 o'clock Eastern. And, of course, back on the radio tomorrow, 11 a.m. Central uh, at InfoWars.com. But fabulous job, the crew, and fabulous job. I salute all of you that are supporters of what we do here at InfoWars Nightly News.